We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working, to ma- working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Troy Davis, who asks, My question is, how do you fund your board gaming hobby? Do you have a monthly budget you give yourself, or perhaps do you sell games to buy new ones? What is your strategy to prevent this hobby from destroying your wallet? Thank you for the question, Troy. This is a great topic and I think an important one. While board games and other tabletop games are fun, uh, everyone needs to realize these are luxury items. These are not needs or necessities. You need to be treated as luxury items. There, you, you Collecting games can be dangerous in a way. Um, for one, it's easy to get caught up in the mix of having to have the new hotness. Second, if there are other board gamers around, or if you're on the internet anywhere and listen to podcasts, there's always trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to make sure who has the biggest game collection. Oh, I got to have the new hot. Oh, if you pick this up yet? No, I've got it. That's part of it. You can spend too much very easily. Plus, there is an addictive nature to it, just like any other collection. Once you go past just buying games you play, you get into collecting games. Got to have them all, every promo, buying games off eBay, getting out of print games. All of that can be a bit of a slippery slope. The important thing is you don't need that new game. No matter what it is, you don't need it. No matter how much you want it, you don't need it. No one needs to buy a board game. You definitely don't need every kind of superhero RPG ever published. Yes, now, if you exactly. Really, if you really need to game, there are many free options out there, from yes. print and plays to making use of items and components you already have on hand. The big thing when buying games, all right, you figure it out, you're, you're going to do it. You, you don't need it, but you want it bad enough, you're going to go buying it. The thing is, you have to make sure that your board game hobby, uh, both buying and the time you spent playing and the time you spent doing it, should never be at the expense of other important things. Uh, Food, rent, paying the bills being probably the most basic that people tend to, um, to skimp on in order to pay for these things. Those are the big ones, but also other things, right? Like spending time with your kids. Um, if you're one of those people like, oh, sorry, I can't buy you the new Zelda game, kids, because I bought you this cool mini or not thing, you might want to look at your priorities there. Clothing. Um, I'll admit, I wear a lot of the same clothes, but my kids need new clothes a little more often than I do and pants. But also time, like family events, right? When If you're, you're skipping Easter because you got to go play on game night or even just getting out of the house and spending money on other recreations like vacations. Just like you need a work-life balance, you also need a game-life balance. The key is, as with most things in life, spending within your means. If you're making minimum wage, you're probably not regularly eating prime rib. Similarly, you probably shouldn't regularly be going all in on that new hot mini game on Kickstarter. Exactly. No, totally it. Now, one thing I do hate to see, and I want to call this out because this has not gone away, and I wish it would. This is is a, a, a an old meme, an old joke that I wish would go away, is people joking about hiding how much they spend. Hiding the, don't tell my wife I bought these games, or how to hide it. Now, even worse are the people actually doing this, not just tongue-in-cheek laughing about it online. This could be hiding it from family, from significant others, from your friends, or even yourselves trying to trick yourselves into, well, I'm going to open it from shrink, put it on my shelf, and then it's it's in the collection already. There's not a pile sitting waiting to go through. Or, you know what, I'm just not going to look at the bank account this month, or I'm not going to, I don't want to add up how much I spent on Kickstarter this month. I just know I backed a lot, right? If you ever find yourself lying about buying games or how much you spent or hiding the amount you bought or own, that is a problem. Now, I'm sure there's a technical term for this type of retail therapy and the hoarding that goes along with it, but I'm no psychologist. I don't want to try to pigeonhole this, but realize this can be a problem. Now, one term that definitely applies in in the case of relationships anyway, is financial infidelity. Yeah. If you are lying to your family and partners about finances and how much is spent, it is financial infidelity and frankly, you should reach out and talk to someone about it. Yeah. So, yes, you need to watch what you're buying and how much you're spending. You should have some form of budget. 
not necessarily a formalized line in your household budget or in your QuickBooks or whatever, but it's got to be something you at least think about and consider. You need to at least be aware of how much you are spending and where the money is coming from and where else it could be going. Now, sadly, the education system, or at least the one I went through, fails pretty seriously mm -hmm. on any sort of financial intelligence. I learned how to balance the books of a business but was expected to just somehow know how a household budget works or how to do your own taxes. Now, I will say my girls have taken some of this. There's a civics course that is a mandatory requirement that does cover, excuse me, that does cover at least like paying rents and mortgages and some of this. So it's more than we had, but it's, I'm sure it's still not enough. Now, as for how big this budget should be, that I can't tell you. I really can't. Everyone's situation is completely different. Your income, your amount of spending money, how deep you are into the hobby, how often you feel the need for a new experience, how often you're willing to play the games you have over and over, how often you play, all of these are all factors. What I would say, though, as a rule of thumb, start low. Like, I don't know, one game every three months, and then if you find you want more and can afford more and they fit into the budget, you can up it. If you've got the money, go nuts. Buy a game a day if you want. Though I got to say that gets into the hoarding thing and you want to make sure you can actually play the games you're doing. Being a board game collector, while it seems kind of cool, I think is generally for most people an excuse. Yes, my hoard looks great. But Bellhop's first rule, the games, the best games in your collection are the ones that hit your table. Try not to outpace it. But if you don't have the money, don't spend it. And even you can start off just by pick a game you want and save money until you can afford that game. And then pick another game and save until you can afford it. Exactly. So those are kind of some generalizations. Yes, you should have a budget. Go, go ahead and buy games. We're not saying you shouldn't, but realize they're luxury items and make sure it's not at the expense of something actually more important. And yes, sometimes it takes a hard look to sit down and divide those two up is what's important. Because leisure activities are important. Gaming is important. Their social activities are important. You shouldn't just say, no, they're not important, but you got to put it up against things like feeding your family, eating healthy, getting exercise, and all the other important parts of life. Absolutely. All right, moving away from the generalizations, let's talk about how I personally handle my board game spending. Now, for this, I'm going to rewind the clock. I'm going to use the time stone and twist it because... Uh, as I'm sure most listeners are aware, a lot of my new games now come from this whole tabletop bellhop thing. That wasn't always the case. Even when I was blogging with the Windsor Gaming Resource and I posted stuff over at Medium, review copies were very few and far between. And the only thing I ever got sent were indie games, indie small publisher, single produce games. It's not like I ever got anything from a big game company. And I've also had to assume that most people out there listening to this aren't doing this as a as a living. I know very few people are, but even as a side hobby. So I want to talk about how I grew my collection to be as big as it is before I became the tabletop bellhop, because I got to say it was pretty big before we decided to do this professionally. The answer, become a well-respected game reviewer or journalist, is simply not really a feasible solution to avoid budgeting for your mm -hmm. games. It's sort of like deciding to become a professional photographer so that you can go see pro football games on the sidelines. Sure, yeah. it's possible, but it's really unlikely that you're going to be the one who gets that chance. Yeah. The only reason I do this, Jim, is to get to see the game. I don't know if there's anyone out there. So my early collection um, honestly started by having gamer parents. Obviously, this is something you can't do about now. Like, oh, I should have had better parents. Uh, you may feel that way, but this is something I want to call out only because if you are currently a parent or planning to be a parent, you want to think about this as something you can do for your kids. You can start your kids off right by letting them have their own games and picking out games themselves. Now, note their own games, not just letting them play your collection and play with your toys. Let them have their own toys and have their own joy of collecting. My kids have their own board game bookshelf where they keep their games on it that they play together and sometimes play with us. I think the important thing here is, is get them into it and let them pick the games, even if they sometimes sound terrible. Though, to be fair, my collection, still to this day, in fact, 
is largely made up by the games I played as a child with my family, mm -hmm. uh, games that were handed down to me from my parents uh, to become the beginnings of my collection. Yeah. Uh, next up for me was saving money where I could to buy the things, gaming things I wanted. Like I got a set amount of money for lunch in high school. You get whatever it was. I don't remember. You get so much a day or so much a week. And what I would do is I would try to save a buck a day by not buying add on. I didn't buy the cookies. And trust me, if you went to Brendan, you wanted the cookies. They have the most fantastic cookies. So I wouldn't buy the cookies or I'd skip the chocolate milk or I not order the extra set of fries or whatever it happened to be in order to save up money to buy gaming stuff. Now, at that time for me, it was Warhammer miniatures. And in general, it took me two weeks to buy another pack of orcs or goblins or whatever miniature I wanted at the time. And that worked for me. Now, the thing is, though, this still applies, though it was something I did in high school. There is no reason anyone can't still purchase games that way. Just basically create some board game savings. Now, I say savings. I'm not saying you need a savings account, though maybe that's the way you do it. It could just be a physical jar you drop money into and you toss in your spare money. Heck, make a swear jar at your game night, and every time someone swears, they, they put a buck in or something, and then the next time the group gets a new game. You're going to save a bit week by week until you can afford the game you want. For more modern, not kids in high school, maybe you skip the Timmies once a week, or you order the small instead of the large, or you make sure to clip some coupons for groceries or shop at multiple stores, even though it's a bit more work. Cut the grass yourself instead of paying the neighbor's kid or whatever you can do to scrimp and save stuff that's already in your budget, just spending less on it so that you now have some money to put towards gaming. Heck, if you're a Starbucks addict, you could skip like two drinks and have a board game. <laughs> well, <laughs> very much true, I'm sure. Uh, you don't you don't need the uh, rainbow frappuccino every day. There you go. Nice and easy. That's all you do. Cut back on the caffeine as I pound a coffee here. Now, looking back at actual budget line items, you can also make your gaming budget be the amount you're under budget somewhere else. So kind of like the scrimp and save, but if you have whatever, and Tim Hortons, honestly, if you do go every day, should be a line item on your family budget. Well, the money you don't spend on Tim's that week or Starbucks or whatever it happens to be could then carry over, right? Like when you're doing your end of month finances, everyone does end of month finances, don't they? No. Uh, you carry that over. Whatever money you saved in the one category goes into the gaming copy, which is one way you can do it. The thing is, just don't overdo it, right? Like, don't take too much away for gaming. Like, for example, I didn't stop eating lunch at school. I still got the core lunch. I got the burger, the pizza, the egg salad or whatever for lunch. It was the extra bits, you know, the cookies, the... For some reason, everyone was obsessed with Mentos at that time. You skip the Mentos and still eat the burger. Now, start early. And don't be ashamed to start small. Yep. If you can only find a dollar a week, great, do it. It might take a little longer, but it might also make you think harder on what you will buy when you have the funds and appreciate having it that much more. True. Now, getting into to being a full-on adult and all the responsibilities that come with it, um, it's going to sound pretentious, and it's definitely a position of privilege, and it's not always fair. But the best way you can afford games is make lots of money. Uh, have a good job that pays well. This is honestly where the majority of my games come from. I worked in the auto industry. I was middle management level for years, and it paid rather well. Well enough that we could afford all the bills and all of, all the, the, the expenses and the rent and everything we needed and still have spending money left over every paycheck. Board gaming can be an expensive hobby. And due to that, the more money you have, the more you can spend and the bigger your collection can be. And this isn't something to be ashamed of. It's just uh, the fact of the world. Uh, money makes the world go round. If you have more money, you can buy more things. And now I see it's, it's in 2023, it seems more true than ever because there are a lot of now high-end luxury games coming out catering to the people who have this money. You got deluxe editions, you got foil cards, you've got miniature versions you've got one thousand dollar opening bid kickstarters and ultra uber deluxe editions yeah again gaming is a luxury and while we all deserve some level of luxury and comfort there's a huge chasm between having a deck of cards that you can sit back and play with over a beer and the latest big box from simon 
Now, for me, eventually we had kids. Uh, inflation's a thing. Costs kept going up. Uh, promotions for me stopped due to the glass ceiling at work. Once you're middle management, it's sometimes hard to get to that next level. Um, and raises got fewer and farther between. And I found even my good job wasn't cutting it. And those savings diminished. Board games honestly weren't on the budget anymore. We got to that point where there were more important things that we had to pay for first. And I had to find a new way to keep up with the hobby because it was something I loved and it was a big part of who I am. And this is where I started applying what I call the gaming pays for gaming method. The only money I spent on games came from games in some way. Now, a big part of this was selling games. I no longer played and trying to get the best price for them. Now, I don't want to get into details on how to do that here, but if you check out the how to make the most of your unwanted tabletop games article over at tabletopbellhop.com or listen to episode 99 of our podcast titled For Sale, we do go into detail on getting the most for your existing game collection or games you no longer want. So if you have managed to assemble a collection, it can be a great way to stretch your funds. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not able to save much, but along with the sale of an old board game you don't find yourself playing anymore, you might be able to get more than you otherwise would have thought. Yeah, and I've mentioned on the show before, but there's a group of my friends that when they get a game, they do everything they can to improve that game, uh, blinging it out, making it look better, and then sell that to buy their next game. And so far, they've managed to not have to spend money. Like, they just keep rotating this big game to this next big game, and that's how they afford those giant Kickstarters, is they play them long enough and then sell them to someone who missed out on the giant Kickstarter to get another giant Kickstarter. Now, eventually this wasn't enough, right? I ran out of the things to sell or I wasn't making much on the used stuff or it was just more work. So what I dove into were so affiliate sales. Now, I want to point this out right away and not because I don't want the competition, but doing affiliate sales is a lot of work for very, very little return on the time spent. When I started doing this, I would literally make cents a week in Canadian cents. And then only after getting the word out all over the place and growing a following over years did that get up to a few bucks a month. And I mean that, a few bucks a month, that's it. Back then, affiliate sales generally meant I could get a new game every two to three months. And what I would do is I would save up credit so that I would wait for a big sale. So I would wait for the buy two, get one free sale and suddenly get three new games at once. And that was it. That's how I bought games, honestly, for a few years. And on top of that difficulty with affiliate, there is a lot of competition for mm -hmm. affiliate sales. Every article you see in your board game newsfeed is almost certainly using affiliate links. A lot of the links on Board Game Geek will be affiliate links. So finding a way to get people to click on your links and not one of the other thousand yeah. affiliate links is tough. Yeah, Board Game Geek did it right. It's actually automated. Every link is an affiliate link on Board Game Geek, and it's automated by their system. So if you click on any of those, you, you, are, you are helping out Board Game Geek, which all the power to them. I'm not trying to say affiliate sales are bad. Like, it is part of how we do things around here. But yes, uh, and my only thing is every article you see, I really, it, they should be disclosing they use affiliate links. You will note on all of our content, we clearly state if we are using affiliate links. Now, of course, years later, after many hours of work, we do pretty good with the tabletop gaming deal side of the business, but it's still not enough to pay our basic bills or anything like that, or even get me a game a week. That said, the gaming for paying for gaming thing is still true to this day. So at this point, for me, gaming actually pays for more than new games for us. But sadly, we're also aware that this can potentially go away in a heartbeat. There yeah. have been plenty of stores who have just said, nope, no affiliate earnings on games. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, many of them have also learned their lesson and come crawling back, but the risk exists and is yes. real. Now, as noted earlier, most of my new collection, my newer collection, the games I'm playing lately and picking up lately do come from publishers in the form of review copies of games. I get a few games every year as gifts as well, and I do buy the occasional game myself as well. And I'm obviously not the only one doing this, right? There are a ton of board game reviewers out there that I'm sure are in the same boat, and this could be a viable way for you to grow your collection. But again, realize there's a lot of work that goes into being a reviewer, and I do not think it is profitable 
to review games to get free games. I, I do not think that is actually a viable option. You have to want to share your love of games. You have to like writing or YouTubing or vlogging or whatever case you're using to get them across. It's just not a, a, a free game is not much payment when compared to the amount of work that goes into preparing and publishing a review. We play each game five times minimum, as we've talked about many times. We post an unboxing, a review on the podcast and on the blog as well as taking pictures both during gaming and as specific setups and editing down a separate review from the podcast uh, and having discussions with publishers both before and mm -hmm. after the product arrives and we deliver our reviews. It's not out of the ordinary for a $40 MSRP game to eat up 40 hours of effort. Yeah. And that's not a great. No, <laughs> I don't know many places in the world that don't have better than a one hour, one, one dollar per hour minimum wage. Though said that said, it could be a viable way to grow your collection. It just realize it's not this simple, easy thing of all I have to do is ask some publishers and they'll start sending me games. Let's go. So that's how I have managed to stay invested in the board game hobby without breaking the bank. At this point, we're assuming you have a budget. You got to have some kind of budget. Again, it doesn't not necessarily even a dollar amount. Even if your budget is I spend everything extra I have, that works. Let's get to some tips on keeping the hobby as affordable as possible and staying under that budget you've set for yourself. Because you did set a budget, right? Yeah. Right? So my first one's pretty simple. It is buy used. Um, buy used games. They're cheaper than new games. You don't need a ding and dent also falls in here. Companies have sales on used games. Your local game store may sell used games. There are fantastic, at least locally, and I assume because it's in Windsor and we're not that big. They're everywhere. Buy and sell groups on Facebook selling games. We actually have three good groups here in Windsor for buying and selling board games, which is pretty awesome. Um, there's Discord channels and so on. Don't pay full price. Uh, try to find used copies. If they're in good shape, you get to know the sellers. Um, I will also recommend Board Game Geek's Geek Market um, for that because Board Game Geek users are alpha gamers. They're the people who took the time to make a Board Game Geek account, and they're taking the time to list their game there. In general, they care a bit more than the average person. And compared to buying a game on the Facebook Marketplace, everything I bought there was not only in excellent condition, but tended to be blinged out in some way. So every game I bought showed up and all of a sudden like all the components are in Plano or there's like so they went out and bought stickers and put them on the meeples and stuff. I have been extremely impressed. Now, as usual, buyer beware. Um, you are it is a marketplace, but like I said board game geek self moderates itself really well. And I have no worries buying that. Yeah. Now, one question you should really ask yourself, though, is do you need to own the games you play? Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can enjoy and play and, and, and delve into the board gaming hobby without heavily investing in mm -hmm. a game library of thousands of games yourself. Right. Uh, one of the primary events that we talk about on a regular basis, and Mo is, is a, a major host of in Windsor, is public play events. I'd go out most public play events. I've yet to be be at one where there weren't games to play that they, they fully expected all of the games to be provided by the people showing up. I don't even know if that type of thing even exists. Someone is providing games at those events. It's a great place to try out and play other people's games, which actually leads to another point about saving money is make sure you are going to like the games you play which is uh, something that falls under a few categories here, but public play events are a great way to do this is go out and try the game. That way you're not buying a game that it ends up. You don't like you're making sure to spend your money more effectively. Now another, um, another great way to, to sort of test this out in advance, uh, assuming you have one in your area and judging by what I've seen, there, there aren't too many sized cities anymore that don't have a board game cafe of some sort. Yep. where you can pay and uh, enjoy some coffee and some board gaming time. Uh, and sure, maybe that'll eat a little bit into your board game budget, but it might be worth it if you get to know that you are going to uh, enjoy that game. Yeah, even better with most board game cafes, I will not say all of them, is most have teachers there that will teach you the games, which is sometimes better than picking something up for yourself and having to learn it. 
So personally, I think that $5 fee per table probably offsets the cost of having someone else teach me how to play something. As well, if you've got a big enough city or you're willing to travel a little bit, there are cons all over mm -hmm. North America and the world where you can go. And almost always these days, many of these cons are going to have some form of board game library or free to play mm -hmm. area or other people who have just brought their board games to introduce them to other people. Uh, cons are a great way to find out this as yep. well as getting demos from publishers. Another thing to watch for at cons are deals, used games, ding and dent. Publishers love to go to cons. If you go to Origins, you have to hit the Cool Stuff Inc. booth and check out their ding and dent. Because remember, these are luxury items and their games you're supposed to be having fun with. They're not pots of gold. If there's a little dent in your copy of Gloomhaven, you're able to pick it up for 50 instead of 150. Who cares about that ding in the box? Absolutely. Uh, cons there's... also provide, sorry, cons also provide a place for publishers to promote their games. And I have learned about so many great games that I've then gone on to purchase through demos. Demos is something special. In general, a publisher running a demo event has set up a special version of the game, a shorter version with certain rules in play or not in play to really highlight the best parts of the games. And they are a great way to experience lots of games in a short amount of time. Most real games or whatever, full games are going to take, you know, two to four hours, depending on the game, where most demos are 10 minutes. So I can try six demo games in the same amount of time I can play one ticketed con game. And that is a great way to learn about new games, at least to do that first initial, do I care? Do I want to learn more? Yeah, be aware that these demo games are obviously set up to show off the game yes. in their best light. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not going to give you that full experience where you discover, oh, well, this one particular part of the game I don't enjoy, but yep. they'll give you a good idea for the general theme and feel of the game, uh, which may be enough to push you to find out more. Yep. Another great way is digitally. Yes. Uh, between Board Game Arena and all of the other online board gaming sites out there nowadays, especially, I hate to say it, thanks to the pandemic, they, a lot of them grew yes. uh, and became uh, more, more popular and uh, better ways to play online games, whether to play be so that you don't buy or to play so that you can learn whether you would like to buy. Yeah, and that includes also a uh, tabletop simulator, Tabletopia, and all the other virtual tabletops as well, and Steam versions of games. Steam has fantastic sales, as everyone knows. Um, we've now fallen in love with Humble Bundle as, or sorry, yeah, yeah, Humble Bundle, not Bundle Holding. Humble, Humble puts games on sale all the time, way cheaper than their physical version. Plus, the digital versions are generally cheaper than the full game anyway. Like the digital version of Terraforming Mars, I think is 30 bucks, whereas the full box is 60. There are also a number of mobile versions of a lot of these games uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and mobile games are often going on discount. Now, another one that's come up, and I have not tested this myself in Windsor, so bad on me. But I see a number of people talking about taking out games at their libraries including um, events at the libraries that they can play. But not only that, like just games on the shelves where you show your library card or your library app in most cases nowadays, and then you get to take the game home and you get it for a week and you have to return it back, just like getting a book. And I have seen a number of people talking about the games they've been playing from their local libraries. It's a bad on me for never checking to see if the local library has anything like that. Should probably get more involved with them. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, and then... Once you've either decided you want to buy a game or have figured out, you know, played a demo, learned the experience, played it enough on Board Game Arena that you just really need to have your own copy, look for sales. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of sales out there. And if you are on a tight budget, uh, there are both sales both at your friendly local gaming store so you can support local. But also we understand that sometimes... You just don't have the money to spend at the friendly local store. Yep. And as much as you'd like to support them, your budget doesn't allow it. And online stores may be the solution. Yeah. 
And in that case, I got a, a little bit of self-promotion. You can follow Tabletop underscore Deals on Twitter or Good Geek Deals group on Facebook or now Tabletop Gaming Deals, all one word, on Dice Camp for those of you who have fled those other social media sites, which I fully understand. Um, that's, that's I share sales on online deals. And yes, most of the links are affiliate links, but not all of them. We share any good deals we find. Um, but yes, I, it makes sense, right? Like if you can't, if you can afford it, please support your local game store. If you can't afford it, please do something else to support your local game store, especially if you play there. Yeah. Promote them, share them, tell your friends about it, use their resources, buy what you can buy. Like if you can't afford all the D and D books, you can at least buy your dice at your local game store, for example. Absolutely. Uh, now, and, on, go ahead. Uh, the other there once you're there, as well as things, there are Facebook groups, especially localized groups. Yep. Uh, and this actually gets into localized groups on Board Game Geek as well. Sure. Uh, but game find groups on whatever your preferred online social media site is that are other gamers in your area. There may be ways to pass games around and trade and and cooperate with each other to expand your library without actually buying mm -hmm. but making use of other board game resources already there in your area yeah there's a, again there's some great facebook groups for here for selling games what i don't see a group for is trading games but there are a number of small like board game groups and rpg groups and dnd groups and sometimes groups for specific games miniature gamer groups where is a great place to trade sell your old games um, the local miniature gamers seem to pass their stuff around a lot, I've noticed. Um, even local game stores sometimes have uh, Facebook groups as well. I will call out Solon's Tabletop Renaissance group. If you are looking to get a miniature, you know, or you're 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 looking to get something painted, that's the place to go. Um, trading games is great, however you do it. We used to run um, RPG book exchanges where we let people get rid of the stuff they're no longer using to get new stuff. And that's always gone well. But I gotta say the ultimate way to trade games, um, though it's a bit of a mess to get into, but once you figure it out, are math trades. These are a thing where there's there's math, uh, an algorithm in the background that basically everyone puts in all the games they want, they put in all the games they have to trade, and then it does all the math for you. So it might be that I give a game to Sean, Sean gives a game to Deanna, Deanna gives a game to uh, Tech, and Tech gives a game to Sean, and then Sean gives a game to me. And in the end, we're all happy, and we all got what we wanted, without any of us actually knowing each other, like, interacting ahead of time. No deals made, no, there's no bartering, there's no, wall. Oh, that's not worth it. It does all the work for you. Yeah, absolutely. Math trades, again, they're really hard to organize, but if you can find an established uh, organization, a group that does math trades, uh, where someone who is familiar with the system and the uh, the algorithms behind it is organizing mm -hmm. it, you can really make get a great uh, return on value, or not return on value, but uh, a great benefit from getting rid of the games you no longer want and finding some new to you versions. And this is another one for cons. Breakout Con happened this last weekend. They had a huge, what they call it, bring and sell bring and buy it was either bring and buy or bring and sell room where people brought in games at the start of the con and there was basically this massive dealer room with i think it might have got to tens of thousands of games like it was just a ridiculous number of games all lined up there the seller set the price i don't even know exactly how it all worked but like oh there, there was so much stuff there like what a great way because again it's impersonal you don't have to be there you just you know you go through the process they take your game they slap a price on it and then people going through pay for it like they were shopping, right? They're like, I'll take this, this, and this. Go up to the breakout people. The breakout people pay you out. And then at the end of the con, you get whatever money you were owed for the people who bought your games. Absolutely. Uh, another great uh, option is, we talked about it in a negative format earlier, yeah. but there is a positive side to Kickstarters. Uh, some Kickstarters offer significant discounts if you're willing to pay in advance and wait uh, over buying that same game in at retail yeah you also often get promos and things like that that are worth it and i will throw in one bonus tip um you can often pay for a kickstarter by not holding on to that bonus stuff because there will be people with it assuming it's a big enough kickstarter who feel they missed out with, whose fomo will be strong and will pay you for you know that neoprene mat 
as much as it might have cost you for that entire Kickstarter. I I happen to know that one book from experience. So speaking of a specific Kuhlman or not game. Just be aware, though, that if you're looking for that uh, retail therapy buzz, that feel of, you know, oh, I got a new game and it feels great. The the time shift involved in Kickstarter yes. can often really sort of suck all the air out of that. Uh, mm -hmm. as as you could in certain you know basketball type games wait years to see that game finally arrive after you've paid or you could get nothing for your money which has happened to me in the past absolutely and then we were saying kickstarter by that we mean all crowdfunding i gotta stop using kickstarter as a like as kleenex it's a xerox <laughs> it, kickstarter has become xerox it's i know <laughs> but it's still we shouldn't be we should we, yes. we should be saying game found kickstarter Crowdfunding game on our sources. crowdfunding. Yes, crowdfunding. Now, what a lot of crowdfunding has become is a pre-order system. What you should look into, though, is pre-order systems from publishers. There are a number of them doing this now. Uh, Stone Mayer Games is one of the more recent I've seen that stepped up doing it. There are a couple others. And what they tend to do, uh, the biggest example is the P500 system from GMT Games. Every GMT game ever published and will ever be published goes through this. If it's a brand new game, it's like, okay, we're thinking of making this brand new game. Here it is. If 500 people order this, if 500 people sign up now to buy it, we'll do a full print run, whatever that is. 5,000 copies, say. I don't know what their print runs usually. Are. If it doesn't hit 500, we don't make it. So in a way, it's a bit crowdfunding, but it's really a pre-order. But what they do to encourage people is they give them a significant discount for being part of the P500 program. Now, other companies are kind of mirroring this, but what they're doing is they're giving either discounts, but what I'm seeing more often is the first expansion free or some promo card or some little extra thing for helping to pre-order it. And I'm seeing this from companies who are moving away from Kickstarter. So it's kind of an evolution of a pre-order system, the Kickstarter stretch goals, switching over to publishers going, why am I using a third party? I can do this myself. Well, I think one of the largest ones would be Hasbro's. Yeah, pulse. System. pulse hasbro pulse uh, uh the next one is uh enter a giveaway like we got a really big 200th episode giveaway with 19 gaming prizes in it all games we strongly recommend uh though i'll admit i haven't played the one from grand gamers guild yet we have not played their holiday hijinks but all the rest of them we we've played reviewed and enjoyed what better way to get games instead of just you know supporting your favorite content creators, your favorite publishers, and uh, possibly getting the game free. And Sorry, 39, 39 prizes. 39 prizes. Uh, yeah. So another option, and this is one that we that got talked up a little bit in our Discord earlier, is shared group libraries. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't need to buy the game, if, especially if you're not the only one who's going to be playing it. If you have a gaming group, the costs of that game can be spread out amongst the group. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have, uh, you know, five people who always get together every Wednesday night and play board games, you can look at splitting that game five ways yep. in cost and everyone essentially group owns that board game. Now, another way to do it too, that makes it so that you're not necessarily arguing if someone leads the group who gets to keep it is rotate who buys the game so you got five people i buy one game then sean buys a game then d buys a game we each have our personal collection but we play them with the group and i'm going to call out something from the chat i know we don't usually interrupt this section of the podcast for the chat but um chicken barf welcome to the show first time chatter called out the problem they've had with p500 is the gmt games have a ton of errata and so it kind of sucks buying them first you get that first printing and I got to say, I kind of see it because most GMT games tend to hit their stride around the fourth printing. So, yes, I can see that. But I guess, like, again, if, if the only way you can afford the new um, post-apocalyptic Thunder Road game is to back it at P500, then you just got to keep up with the errata online. And that's better than not being able to have the game. It's not like the Kickstarters we, we all like love to back. And game found games don't have the same sort of problems. So it's it's far from a unique to P500 issue. Which uh, Angie Games replied that it also sucks when your paid copies are beta testers. And I got to say, here's another way. You can play test games. Publishers are always looking for play testers. It's surprisingly easy 
to get in as a play tester on various games. Now, I will say nowadays, most publishers are, are, are saving money by using digital tools to play the games. They tend to use Tabletop Simulator or um, Tabletopia or something like that nowadays, which just makes sense because then you can play test your game all over the world without having to ship anything. But if you really want to be on the cutting edge, it's surprisingly easy to play test games. Way easier than, say, getting review copies. Absolutely. And many times it's as simple as joining a Discord and paying attention to uh, yeah. announcements. But one thing that really helps keep the budget down, that really is, you know, some one of the cheapest solutions out there, is play the games that you already own. Yep. Again, you don't need that new game. Think of the one you just bought, the one you saved up a buck a week 10 years ago when you didn't have such a good job and you finally got it and you were so happy to bring it home. Maybe you dust that off and play it again. I've got games behind me from the 70s that still get played because they're fun. Yep. There's no reason that you have to play the brand new, shiny, big box game from this or that company. There's a lot of games out there already that <laughs> you know, probably have. Uh, and I mean, worst case, get a deck of cards and pick up a, pick up a copy of Hoyle. And yeah. uh, there's a few hundred games you own right then and there. You go to the Tabletop Bellhop blog. We've got an entire article with over 100 RPGs you can play with a standard deck of cards. Note, not all of those are free, but some are. Uh, or go to the Tabletop Bellhop and look at the free print and plays yes. listing, where for the cop for the uh, price of a little bit of ink and paper, you may have a whole new board game that you love. Yeah, I think we've got over 300 games on that particular list. Games or expansions. There's some expansions for games. Um, the next one, I, I realize this one, this one's a little busy and does upset some people, but you know what? You do what you got to do is make money from your collection. There is people out there who rent their games, like rent them to other people to use them. There are people who will go to a stranger's house and run a game night for them for a fee, uh, usually not an insignificant one. You could run events at the Finley Oakle Game Store, maybe in exchange for games or store credit. You can host a board game tournament in your local area and keep a portion of the entry fees to compensate yourself for your time and for any wear and tear on your games. There are ways to monetize your board game collection, and there's nothing wrong with doing this. I realize people seem to think a hobby means you can't make money on it. I'm going to make you ding the bell and say that's b <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a reason, you know, people are going out there and DMing games for money. Well, there's really very little difference between the effort involved in setting up uh, and building a scenario and, play and playing that with a group of people or taking a significant, you know, Euro game and teaching it and, and helping a group of player, mm -hmm. players play that game. Uh, there's very little difference indeed. Uh, and so why yeah. one should be accepted while the other isn't is beyond me. Though I got to say the paid DMing isn't accepted by a large group of people either, but pay people for their time effort. That mm -hmm. just should be something the world needs to start doing better at. Um... So another thing is look for free games, other places, like we called it a couple places you can go on our website, but there are a number of free games out there. Uh, if you go to the one bookshelf set of sites, like there's a ton of these, there's war game vault for you, war gamers, there's drive through RPG for the RPG players, there's drive through cards, there's um, specific sites for Savage Worlds and Pathfinder and D&D &D and all those. All of those have a button on the left-hand side on their menu that says free games. You click on that, you will get thousands of free games. In addition, uh, itch.io is another one. Itch.io, a lot of people are offering up free games, not just RPGs. And then there's pay what you want games, PWYW games out there as well, which fit any budget. They're literally free for the people who can't afford them. And so uh, I do say, yep. if you can afford them, please at least pay something for them. Absolutely. As well, there are uh, copies available for free from uh, for people who are who have needs. Uh, yep. Sometimes you get Kickstarters where uh, for every time who every person who buys a game at this level, another free version is released for people who uh, are in need. Yes. Uh, and another uh, fantastic option out there is going back to Itch.io 
is uh, good causes. Right now, for trans rights in Florida, there is a fantastic bundle. For oh, yeah. $5, you get, uh, I, I'm, I'm not even sure of the actual count right now, but it's usually it's in the hundreds of games. Now, most of these are RPGs. There are some video games in there, uh, but there may be some some sort of simply simplish-ish board games as well. And that's $5 for hundreds of games, and you're donating to a great cause. I will point out a minimum of $5. Minimum. It is a pay what you want. If you wish to support the cause, you can donate any amount. Uh, and it's over 500 games, Jeff is clarifying. Yeah. It's a fan, like Thirsty Sword Lesbians is the big one most people are pushing, but there are a lot of big names in that one. Absolutely. Now, one All right, thing, you have anything else? I was just going to use that, do that wrap up. Oh, okay. So one thing we absolutely do not condone or encourage in any way is the pirating of games in any forms. Mm-hmm. Making games takes a lot of work and involves a lot of people, and all of those people deserve to be compensated for that work. 100%. Do not pirate. You wouldn't download a car, would you? Sorry. I didn't mean to make light of it. That ad just popped into my head. No, seriously, people deserve to be paid for their work. Absolutely. So that's it for our talk on board game budgeting. I hope this segment has been informative and encouraged you to set some form of formal limit on your spending, but also helped you get more games for your buck under that limit. Now we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder, we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop up at the top left of the page. Uh, You can send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com Or you can message me on social media where I can be found everywhere as tabletop bellhop, one word. 